All right, uh, so let's get started. So I hope you can hear me okay. And so this is the second lecture on quantum gases in one spatial dimensions. Uh, and last time we established an equivalence between a Fermi gas in one dimension uh, and a particular type of relativistic boson. Um, and this is an exact equivalence, uh, which turns out to be very powerful in uh, dealing with interacting systems, where you can actually make some exact statements about interacting systems that you can't make in higher dimensions. Anyway, so uh, any questions? I'm just going to review the basic what we established last time and then move on to uh, using it for something new. All right, so the the basic theory was just free fermions. And if you, if you write it in terms of a field theory, uh, it has right moving fermions and left moving fermions with some Fermi velocity Vf. And, in, and we're assuming that this dispersion goes off uh, you know, from uh, at arbitrary momenta, there's no uh, UV cutoff. And fortunately, it turns on in 1D, all the UV divergences can be controlled by just normal ordering all expressions. So these are uh, fermionic quantum fields, which obey the standard fermionic anti commutation relations. Uh, and of course, to keep in mind, X and X prime are simply labels here. They're not actual degrees of freedom. The so degrees of freedom are the fermions, psi right and psi left. So here's the uh, Hamiltonian form of it. Here's the Lagrangian. So the, these anti-commutation relation in the Lagrangian formulation just uh, amount to including, as you saw in one of the uh, sections, uh, this psi dagger d by d tau psi term. Okay, so the claim is that this theory uh, it's exactly equivalent to another theory, which I'm going to define here. So it's a theory in terms of two fields, phi and theta, uh, which live on a line, x. And they obey this uh, rather peculiar commutation relation that we haven't seen before. Uh, but once you have this commutator, you can write down the equation of motions of all the operators. And so it's a just a, actually a Gaussian theory. You can work out everything. So these two lines completely define a theory of two scalar fields, phi and theta, that live on a line. And we also established that there, there's a connection between the spectrum of this theory uh, and the fermionic theory, and it also uh, amounts to a connection at the level of operators that the gradient of phi measures up to factors of pi, the sum of right movers and light, left movers, and gradient of theta measures the difference of right movers and left movers. Now you might wonder, you know, why am I mixing together right movers and left movers in this peculiar way? Uh, and that's partly for historical reasons, uh, because people always thought you could never separate right movers and left movers. Any any field system would have both right and left movers. Uh, and partly because, uh, in fact, some of the things are simpler. But eventually, we will be very interested in systems that are chiral, that only have root movers and not left movers. And this formalism also works beautifully for chirals, uh, boson, chiral fermions and chiral bosons. And the chiral Bose degrees of freedom are phi right and phi left, which are just the sum and difference of phi and theta. OK, so that's where we were. So let's now, before we proceed, just write this in a somewhat more familiar form this theory. I mean, I think yes, last time we proved that these two theories are equivalent by a variety of methods where you put the system on a circle, you quantize, you compute the entire spectrum, and uh, there was just a, it was all a matter of commuting a whole bunch of commutators carefully, and the net result was you showed that these two theories are exactly the same. Okay, so, so how do I write this in a more familiar form? Well, first of all, what we want to do uh, is write, you know, we are familiar with field theory where you have some field phi, which is like, say, the coordinate of some uh, degree of freedom. And when we quantize something, we need, we need not just the coordinate, but we need the conjugate momentum, because then you can impose the Heisenberg commutation relation. 
So in this case, phi is our coordinate. X is just a label for many degrees of freedom. So phi is our coordinate. What is the conjugate momentum? Well, the conjugate momentum has to be something uh, which obeys the Heisenberg commutation relation, uh, which is in fact obtained if you just take the gradient of this relation with respect to y. If you take a gradient of the left and right side with respect to y, you get that the phi is the commutator with grad theta is i pi times delta. Okay, now this is completely the analog. You know, I, I want you to invite you to compare this relation uh, with, you know, you have some coordinates x, i, and let me call it q to prevent confusion with the other x. So you have a whole bunch of coordinates, uh, q sub i, and you have some momenta, p sub j, then Heisenberg will tell you the commutator is i h bar delta i j. So now what we do, effectively doing, is taking the limit where i and j run over an infinite number of values. So this delta becomes a delta function. X and y are like i and j. And so this tells us that q of i is phi of x, and p of j is like grad theta of y. So we, are, we deduce then that the extra factor of pi um, h bar was one. So we can get rid of that and also the sign is off. So that tells us that minus grad theta of pi is the conjugate momentum to phi. Okay, now once we identify q's and p's, we can write down a path integral. It's just uh, exactly this, pq dot plus the Hamiltonian in imaginary time. So I do the same with these uh, phi's and this momentum, and then I get uh, the the basic action now. So this is the action of phi and theta. It has the old Hamiltonian, but it also has uh, this, you know, it's a pure phase term. You could call it a very phase term or some sort of topological term, which tells you about the commutator between theta and phi. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you can integrate this by parts and you can interchange the role of phi and theta uh, it'll have basically the same form up to us. Yeah, okay. And now, of course, you can take this theory and, and integrate out the P. That's usually what you do in the Feynman path integral. You have a P squared over 2M uh, plus I PQ dot plus some V of Q. Then you get the integrate over P and then you get the Lagrangian. Uh, and if you do that here, there's two, you can either integrate over phi or you can integrate over theta. You get the same theory uh, for the phi and theta. And now this has a very familiar form. This is basically the relative, the, the action for a massless relativistic scalar field, which could be either phi or theta. Okay. So that's why we call it a relativistic boson because it's a, just a relativistic massless scalar field. It's not, you know, our Bose gas yet. We'll get to our Bose gas pretty soon. Uh, this, this is a, low energy description right now of a Fermi gas, a free Fermi gas. It turns out to be a free Fermi gas generically in one dimension is that low energy is described by a relativistic field theory, which is the one written right here. Okay, so any questions so far? All right, so to move forward, uh, we want to now, uh, what's the next thing I have to talk about? Uh, yeah, so we want to now uh, write an op expression for the fermion creation and annihilation operators. I do have an expression for the bosons in terms of the fermions, but now I want an expression for the fermion in terms of the boson. And this is much trickier. It was this expression was not known to Tomonaga or Luttinger. Uh, I believe it was Schlotman and Schlotman who first discovered it, uh, studying, uh, I think, the some kind of bosonized version of the condo problem. Uh, and, but then pretty quickly, I, I think there was also a version of it that uh, Coleman had a bit later. Uh, and uh, you know, you know, now it's become very standard technology, uh, in, including it's a key piece of what goes into string theory, these so-called vertex operators. Okay, well, we are down to earth. We're really actually dealing with the, you know, just a wire. Uh, of fermions moving along that line. And we want to write an operator for the Fermi to create a fermion. Now, 
um, just like so far we've been completely exact and this you can also be completely exact for psi uh, but it's a lot of work and it depends on your regularization so you can choose a very clever regularization uh, at high momenta and then write down exact expressions for psi of x uh, which obey all the necessary computation relations well those turn out to be uh, you know rather complicated i think they were first worked out by haldane uh, and we won't do that because in general, you know, we don't know what the high energy physics is. We are only interested in low energy uh, uh, universal characteristics. And there's a universal part of it that you can get by a very simple argument. Uh, but the price you'll pay is that you don't actually get everything. And there are some prefactors and some features you don't get right. But those are factors features that are not very important for the low energy physics. They really depend on the microscopic detail. So, so it's all fine. In particular, what we want to do is write down an operator, psi of x, which anti-commutes with its, itself. Psi of x anti-commutes with psi of y or psi dagger of y, when x and y are not equal. But the right-hand side of this equation here, when x becomes equal to y uh, here, you know, has this delta function. But the delta function is mostly zero, except when x equals x prime. And when x equals x prime, you're coming to very short distances. And really, the fact you have a lattice is surely important when x equals x prime. So we won't get the delta function right. We don't really care about the delta function. We're only interested in these formulae when x and x prime are not equal to each other. And that's the important part we should get. And to get that, well, you can kind of guess the answer from the computation relations you have, or you can get it from the simple physical argument I'm now going to present. So here's the argument, and it's really quite an elegant and beautiful argument. And believe me, <laughs> its simplicity belies how complicated this was to derive by the people who figured it out first uh, in a more exact manner. So we start from this relation that the gradient of phi is the total density. Um, for, for a moment, I'm not going to distinguish between right movers and left, left movers. I'm going to keep them both. So gradient of phi is pi times uh, rho. So if I have, so here's a nice picture to keep in mind. If I have some fermions sitting at x1, x2, x3, x4, these are delta functions. Uh, they're sitting at these points, then phi is a function that has a step function. It goes up by pi every time I see a particle. So it's like this function that just jumps by pi every time I cross a particle. Because then, uh, then if you integrate phi in any distance and in any, any region, you'll get the total number of particles in that region times pi. Okay, so this is what phi looks like. All right, so now I want to take this take this configuration of particles and add another particle. So I'm going to add another particle, uh, you know, let's say at some point here, x zero. Well, look, no, let's call it x. So I'm going to, oh, sorry, I'm going to remove a particle at the point x. So what will phi do? Well, phi, therefore, at the point x, since I've removed a particle, uh, the new phi uh, has to come down by pi. Uh, no, it has to go up by pi, sorry. So, um, so I removed the piece all. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not adding a particle and removing a particle. So I can't remove a particle that wasn't there to begin with. Whoops, okay. I was thinking in my mind of adding a particle, but the formula written down of removing a particle. Uh, it's no big deal. You could do it either way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove a particle, say, at x2. I'm going to remove particle x2. So this I'm going to say is equal to x. And I'm going to remove that particle. So if I remove that particle, what happens to phi? Well, phi has the feature uh, that now it looks something like this. So after I remove the particle, for all y less than x, I have to increase phi by pi. Okay, so that's certainly something I have to do. 
But that's not sufficient. So now I've actually removed a particle by just shifting pi for all y less than x. And I don't worry so much about what happens at infinity. You know, if you want to get it exactly as I had you to put it on a circle and worry about what happens at infinity, that's very complicated, but we just take an infinite system. Uh, then I also have to remember that these once I this particle removal operation uh, removes a fermion. So how can I take care of that? Well, the way you can take care of that is giving this removal operation a phase factor. So if I remove a particle here versus I remove a particle, say that one, when going from here to there, I I, I have to go through this x3. So I should pick up, pick up a minus sign every time I cross a particle. So therefore, I have another factor, which is minus one to the number of particles for y less than x. Or you can make it y greater than x. It doesn't matter either way. It's fine. So we just choose to make it y less than x. So these are the two operations I have to do to get an operator, uh, which changes the total density in that region by the right amount, uh, and also make sure that the operator, as we'll verify, anti-commutes with everything. Okay. It won't get the delta function right, but we don't care about that. All right, so now once you have these words, it's really easy to figure out what this operator is. So I've got now, now you have the words, now I write down the operator. So I have to increase pi by pi to the left of x. Well, that means I have to shift pi by pi. Now, what is the shift operator in quantum mechanics? The shift operator is e to the minus i p. But here, p is the momentum conjugate. Pi sub phi is the momentum conjugate to phi. And you shift it by pi uh, and integrate from all minus infinity to x. But what is pi sub well, okay, so that's that's the first operator. So the first operator here gives me this factor. And we know what pi sub phi is. We'll uh, stick it in in a minute. And then I have to just sum over the number of particles for y less than x. So I'm going to do that as e to the i. And I'm going to, since in the end, I'm going. To, it turns out that I have to allow for all possible ways of getting minus one. and And this means that I'm going to allow e to the put a factor of e, my, e to the i m pi where m is an odd number. Um, and so these are possible factors that will have this feature, and I, I have to keep all of them now exactly which one comes in with what weight and depends on doing things more exactly. But we can imagine that such factors do the trick. Any one of these factors will do the trick. So I have to count all the numbers all the particles of y less than x. So this has two contributions. One is the contribution of the Fermi C. I have to remember that I have a Fermi C here, uh, you know, between plus kf and minus kf. This is k and I have these all. So how many particles do I have there? Well, that's just pi times kf because the density uh, is pi times kf, or kf is in density by pi. So that's the background, that's the normal ordered contribution. Uh, so that's the density, and you multiply it by x, because you have the position x. Uh, and then, uh, and I forgot to integrate this, and then you also have to integrate uh, the, the fluctuation, and the fluctuation would be uh, minus infinity to x uh, of this whole thing, uh, pi times psi dagger right psi right uh, times dx. Okay. So fortunately, you know, the whole bosonization procedure was uh, set up so that it's very easy to identify operators that do exactly what uh, this, this operation demands. All right, now I just do the integrals. Pi sub phi was grad theta. So I can integrate grad theta trivially up to factors of pi. Uh, and the total density psi dagger r uh, plus r psi r plus psi, r, psi dagger l psi l, but that's simply grad phi. So I can also integrate grad phi. So when the dust settles, I get a very remarkable expression, which is right here. So the Fermi creation operator. 
uh, is given by sum over r numbers m of a whole bunch of fields, which are exponentials of phi and theta. Uh, and here m, this, so this tells you that there's a rapidly varying piece, which oscillates by kf. Uh, and then you get i m phi and from the integral over density, and you get an i theta from the shift of phi to the left of uh, x. And a sub m are some numbers. So the only thing this argument can't give you what those numbers are. But those numbers, you know, they're not universal numbers. They depend on specific details of your Hamiltonian and your lattice structure. So short of actually doing a full computer calculation for your particular system, it's very hard to know what those numbers are. But modulo those numbers, this does the trick. And now there's an infinite number of them, but actually life is simple because you see that the rapid variation, there's a variation as k sub f, where right, m equals one, and there's a variation minus k sub f at m equals minus one. And those are obviously the fermions that live, live here and here. So therefore, I have then my even more important formula that size of right is e to the i theta plus five times some constant. And sides of left is e to the minus i theta minus phi. That's it. No factors of pi, everything beautifully disappears. Um, and it's just theta plus phi and theta minus phi. Or even more elegantly, if you remember the chiral bosons, it's size of r is e to the i phi right, and size of left is e to the minus i phi left. And you know, in a sense, the factors of pi had to disappear because theta is only defined modulo two pi. It's a periodic field if you go back and think about the previous definition from last lecture. Uh, and there it is. So that's the remarkable bosonization formula. It's equation 42 really. That the fermion is just the exponential of the corresponding chiral boson. So this relativistic boson which is theta plus phi or theta minus phi or, or Fancy phi right or fancy phi left. And now you can, okay, so this is the proposal from this hand waving argument, but now you can check this. You can check, uh, uh, you know, does this have all the right features? So for example, one thing you'd like is that the uh, commutator of the density with the fermion operator should be just the fermion operator times the delta function. And you can check that that works out from the commutators of phi and theta uh, that we gave before. In fact, I just wrote them down here. So you, you just have to use uh, these relation, this relation here, uh, this relation. And from this, you can check that that expression makes complete sense. In fact, we could have just guessed it based on that if you knew a little bit more about the properties of exponentials of operators. So for example, uh, you know, in previously in the notes, you know, you can using the, the, the commutators of phi and theta or phi left and phi right, you can establish these very useful identities of exponentials of operators. And, and these follow from this very important, this is called the baker campbell Hausdorff lemma. If A and B are any operators, uh, and you also assume that a commutator b is a pure is a number. It's not it's not an operator. A commutator p uh, is a complex number. It's proportional to the trivial operator. Uh, then this is an important, very useful identity for how you commute through exponentials of operators. So using those expressions, you can you can verify these expressions for alpha and beta or any old numbers. And, and then you can verify indeed, you've got all the right features. Uh, it's anti-commutes, it commutes with the density in the right way and, uh, and you're done. Okay, so I've summarized, you know, in, uh, in 20 minutes, uh, you know, a very deep result that took the community a long time to figure out. Uh, but it's remarkable how simple it is in the, in the end uh, once you choose the right notation. In fact, the whole notation, all the factors of pi were cleverly chosen earlier uh, so that this came out as simple as it does. Uh, 
All right. And now really we have everything. Now it's just a matter of uh, you have a complete equivalence of operators uh, and uh, on both sides between the Fermi and free Fermi gas uh, and uh, relativistic Bose gas. Uh, we can map one to the other. I should call it a Bose gas. Relativistic massless scalar field. Okay. And the relativistic massless scalar field can also be separated into the chiral components, uh, the right moving field and the left moving field. Uh, this is what, if you're doing string theory, people do this at step one and they only deal with the right movers uh, because that's a conformal field theory. Uh, and, uh, and the right moving and left moving relativistic scalar fields map onto uh, the uh, the right moving and left moving fermions with this very simple uh, relationship, just the e to the i phi. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions? I should say, no one said anything. All right. So now, now let's use this for something. You know, this is nice. It's a it's a curious mathematical identity between a system I like, which is the free Fermi gas, and a system that you know I'm not going to make in the lab any any day soon, with some relativistic scalar field. Uh, so what's the big deal? Well, Shubino, the reason Shubino. this is so powerful. Yes, Juven. Sorry, this is a technical question, but uh, I'm not sure I can answer either. So the fermions are in a spinner representation of a space time. So much uh, yes, right? yeah, they're, they're left and right moving. Yeah, they are spinner. Fermions. Yeah, but if you want to make them wild for me, you should think of psi right and psi left as wild fermions. But phi are boson, which are scalar, scalar representation in, the, in terms of a you know, is, what, spinner representation, yeah. for example, in one plus one, it will be like a SO2 or spin two, or That's one right. comma yeah. one. But, but boson yeah. is just a trivial one. It's a trivial representation. Yes. So how the right. two things can be relayed in equation 41 uh, for, or 42? I don't, I don't yeah, know the answer well, either. Maybe, maybe I'm just <laughs> stupid. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the question you're asking is pretty much equivalent to why, is this, why do the fermions anti-commute? Uh, and they anti-commute because of uh, the peculiar nature of, uh, of commutation relations of scalars in one plus one D. I mean, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a non-perturbative expression. It involves infinite numbers of powers of the field phi. And uh, I must, I imagine that there's some anomalous term in the Lorentz transformation, which is the commutator of phi with itself, uh, which comes in and then gives you in the end a spinner field out of a, uh, out of a scalar field. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Also, it is, expression it is quite 40, a mark of right, yeah. right. Expression 42, do we need to use normal ordering for some kind of a double? Sure, yeah. So the normal ordering, as we'll see, just changes the prefactor, so it doesn't matter since I haven't specified the prefactor anyway. Yes. So the normal, as we'll see, the normal ordering this expression just gives a constant prefactor. So the normal ordered exponential is the... Uh, is proportional to the unnormal ordered exponential. Yeah, you're right. But formally, it should be normal ordered. There is an infinity there that we want to take out. We're going to get to that in a minute. Yeah, so here in 1 plus 1D, the space time group is abelian, right? So I guess it's, uh, so in terms of the representation theory, there are also 1D reps. So Probably you can just. That's true. I see. Because okay. spin, spin two is SO2 and it's also U1. So probably relate to. Yeah. yeah. It's one dimensional representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you do this in uh, higher dimensions, uh, you need, uh, well, you can do it, but you need these monopole operators floating around, yeah, which are quite non-local in terms of the original fields. Um, all right. 
So we'll get to that hopefully by the end. All right, so let's use this for something. So I, what I was saying was that the reason we're doing this uh, is it turns out that when you add some in interactions to the fermions, uh, the Fermi theory becomes complicated and we can't solve it, you know, uh, but the Bose theory still remains as simple as it was. And so again, for spinless fermions, you know, if you have some, and let's not ignore the, let's ignore the long range Coulomb interaction uh, here. So there's some, say you're doing a Hubbard model or something, uh, then really at long distances for some Fermi gas, the only interaction uh, is the square of the density, grad phi u times density squared. But the density is just grad phi. So this is the beauty. The density uh, was a bilinear in terms of the fermions, but it's a linear in terms of phi. So all you get is an additional term, which is, Retain so the fermionic theory, the bosonic theory is still Gaussian, uh, and then life is great. Um, you can go through everything, and so again, a little bit of algebra shows you that you can absorb this into our previous formalism, but just one, but first by rescaling the Fermi velocity, and second by introducing this coupling constant k. So there's this number k which is often called the Leidenger parameter. So in this is a dimensionless number. So this is very important, the value of this number. So if somebody has a 1D Fermi gas uh, in your lab, then you will often get the question, what is the value of K? It's some number. Is it for repulsive interactions, it's greater than K1, and for attractive interaction, the other way around. For repulsive interaction, it's smaller than one, and for attractive interaction, it's greater than one. Anyway, so K is a number, which you can compute to first order in perturbation theory, but in general, you would require some more sophisticated numerical or the answer solution to figure out the value of K. And where does K appear? Well, it already appeared in the formulae that are in the, in the notes. I was just, the formulae I was giving you uh, for the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian had this K floating around. And I was just anticipating what would happen there. So in fact, this is the actual theory uh, for phi and theta in the presence of a non-zero k. Notice it only changes the Hamiltonian, that it doesn't change this term. And it doesn't change any of the operative representations. Those are just kinematical statements of the commutation relation, as is this, this term here. So now if you integrate out phi and theta, uh, there is a difference. The theory for phi has k in the denominator, the theory for theta has k in the numerator. Uh, so k goes to one over k is the same as changing, interchanging phi and theta. Um, and this is, you know, analog of what's called t-duality in string theory. Uh, anyway, but there are many differences in the interpretation. Anyway, okay, so, so now that's what, so this theory, with this Gaussian action, uh, it's called, it's the theory of the Tom and Argyle Lattinger liquid. So what we have discovered uh, for now is that an interacting Fermi gas is some sort of liquid. It's not a Fermi liquid as we're going to see in a minute, it's some sort of liquid, which at low energies um, has a phonon-like mode, which I can call either phi or theta. And this phonon-like mode, this the scalar field has a relativistic uh, action. And that relativistic action is characterized by two numbers. One is the Fermi velocity. Well, that's a you know, dimensionful number uh, that you just have to measure in the experiment. And the other is this dimensionless number k. Uh, and the dimensionless number k does change aspects of the low energy property. It's an important number characterizing uh, this theory, this Luttinger liquid theory. So the Luttinger liquid theory in some sense uh, is a line of fixed points in an RG sense. And along that line, K varies. And for different K, you have slightly different properties uh, that we'll now discuss. So this is, you know, we've discovered a new phase of matter and this is its action. Uh, furthermore, you can see that if you take a Fermi gas at generic density, 
uh, you know, you could add more interactions, whatever you want. Uh, it's it's not difficult to see, but I won't go through it. Uh, nothing will change in terms of the low energy theory. It can you can change the 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 value of EF, you can change the value of K, but other than that, uh, the only corrections will be have even more derivatives of phi, like grad phi to the fourth or d by phi tau to the fourth, and those are not important at low energies. So this is the universal theory of the thermodynamical Lardinier liquid, equation 32. Okay, so if you, okay. I guess you want to, yeah. you want to say why, 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 why we cannot scale, scale phi to remove K? Oh, yes, thank you. We can't rescale phi. We're not allowed to rescale phi in theta uh, because, well, many ways to see it. Uh, but, but for example, the, uh, you know, if you rescale phi, then you'd have to also remember that you can, you have to change this mapping. So we don't want to change this map. We want to preserve this mapping, this one here. If you rescale phi and theta, well, this mapping will change. We don't want to do that. We want to preserve this and we want to remember that phi is a field that lives on a circle, that's periodic to pi. Uh, and uh, so if you rescale that, you would change the radius of the circle. So we will kind of work on a circle of fixed radius. Now, string theorists and particle physicists do end up rescaling phi, and, and they prefer to use a language in which there's no coupling k, but there's a radius of the circle keeps changing. Uh, well, okay, in all of the quantum hall and condensed matter literature, we don't do that. Uh, we keep the circle of unit radius, and we we have this uh, we have this uh, um, a coupling k that appears in the action. Okay, that's pretty universal in the condensed matter literature. But it does make you know when you're reading a particle physics paper and trying to figure out what they're doing. Uh, this particular difference is quite annoying because you have to remember what the normalization conventions are. I've just followed the condensed matter convention here. All right. Um, so now, now we have a theory of an interacting Fermi gas. Um, so we can now ask, yes, Patrick, there question. Is a, there is a question from Patrick. Yeah, go ahead. I, so I've heard of um, bosonization, like this theory of bosons is described as some sort of like 1D hydrodynamics because it's described in terms of the density. Uh, yes. Um, so one thing I've wondered is that, um, so when we did this derivation, we kind of assumed that all the fermions were very close to the Fermi level. So, right. and yes. we just said VF was a single number. But if, if we added en enough fermions and the band dispersion wasn't perfectly linear, you could imagine VF changing. And in, yes. partic in particular, I think they'll give like some sort of like phi grad phi term. Yeah, so well, I think what you're saying is what if you raise the temperature so that you excite fermions away from a point where the dispersion is not purely linear? Uh, and yeah, so that will end up being, uh, you know, higher order derivative terms to the uh, thermonagal Lattinger liquid action. Uh, and those are, again, you know, at higher temperatures or higher frequencies that could be important, but not at the lowest temperatures. Those are formally what are called irrelevant corrections uh, to the theory. I think I'm just uh, curious. They've, I'm curious if you they've been worked out in like, deep. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I'm kind of, so in 1D hydrodynamics, um, there's the- so Let me also correct you there. It is true, and, and I think this is kind of unfortunate. People talk about this as the hydrodynamic theory of the Fermi gas. Uh, unfortunately, especially in the sense what hydrodynamics used to mean, and again means now in graphene, that's totally wrong uh, terminology. Hydrodynamics is a theory where you have strong, inelastic scattering and strong dephasing so that there's a relaxation, there's thermal, there's local equilibration. The word hydrodynamics used to mean that you have local thermal equilibration and you're talking about this physics at longer scales where there's local thermal equilibration at short scales. That is the traditional meaning of hydrodynamics. 
it is a mistake of our community that to apply the word hydrodynamics to this thing. This is not hydrodynamics. This is just some effective low energy theory of completely coherent excitation. They're just free. They don't have, they don't thermally equilibrate at all. You created a theta excitation at some momentum and frequency, it'll stay there forever. It's just a free particle. Uh, anyway, so that was a small peeve there, but so I don't like to use, call this hydrodynamics, but go on. <laughs> I see, thank you. Um, I, I'm kind of just curious if there's, so, yeah, I, I agree that it, it. I've I've wondered that too, and it, I'm I'm kind of wondering if there's still any way to. Yeah, I, I think I agree that it's still it's different than ordinary hydrodynamics, but it's there's still some similarities, and I'm wondering if some of the things in hydrodynamics have analogs. So, like in in particular, there's Berger's equation in hydrodynamics where mm -hmm. if you if you just linearize Berger's equation, you get an equation very similar to the equation of motion of this theory. Um, but if you don't linearize it, then you get these shock waves. And I'm wondering if there's any quantum analog of that. Cool. Um, not that I know of. So Berger's equation uh, is intrinsically a non-equilibrium situation where you have some kind of dissipation or heat path coupled to your system. So it, so it's, it will not appear in equilibrium thermodynamic properties, even at higher temperatures uh, of, of this kind of theory. It's, I think it's okay. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. Do you need to break unitarity or something? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, right. So, and these higher order corrections that I mentioned earlier, those have been studied. I was going to say they have, they, they are, I think Glassman has many papers on, uh, on that. But we're not going to discuss that here. It's it's a correction to the things we're talking about. All right. So now let's look at the leading properties of this liquid, this quantum liquid. And what we're going to try to compute uh, is basically the very basic property we compute in a Fermi liquid, which is the momentum distribution function. So we just want to compute, uh, you know, n of k which is basically expectation value of psi dagger k, psi k. Uh, and we'll be satisfied by just computing it for k in a kf, for example. So then it'll be psi dagger r of k. Well, it'll be k minus kf here. And psi r of k minus kf. So we're going to go near one of the Fermi points and just look at the expectation value of psi dagger psi. And really, so we just have to compute this expectation value of, and just use this, this uh, powerful expression. We have psi right and psi left in terms of phi and theta. So I just have to take them at different points in space. Uh, and then I have to evaluate uh, the correlation function. So what I'm going to end up evaluating is psi dagger r of x uh, equal times psi r of zero. So suppose I want to evaluate that and then take the Fourier transform that will give me N of K. So the Fourier transform of this uh, is the uh, uh, N of K. So N of K minus KF is just the integral of this, as you can check, times E to the I K minus KF, uh, sorry, yeah, X. N of K, sorry, let's put it in the wrong place, N of K, uh, is yeah, four a transform of that as a wave vector of k minus k. So I just need the two point correlation function of these exponentials. And turns out those can be evaluated. So here, the beauty of this is that all the nonlinearities uh, are up, are in the operator. The theory itself is Gaussian. Okay, so we just have to evaluate that expectation value. Uh, and this is related to the normal ordering question in some sense that uh, Juven asked. And so these kind of things you, you meet all over the place and that'll probably be a homework problem you'll have to use this. And you use this very basic identity. As long as you have any set of harmonic oscillators, you can prove for any harmonic set of harmonic oscillators, no matter how, how many, and always some linear combination of the X's and P's of the harmonic oscillators, then the e to the expectation value of any harmonic operator, exponential of an operator, is just e to the minus O squared over two. 
So this is easiest to evaluate in the path integral method, where it's just a version of completing the square. It's a lot more difficult to establish in the operator approach, uh, but can be done. So I, I'll just leave this as a uh, identity that we're going to use. So we use this identity. And then, so basically everything then becomes two point correlation functions of O, you know? So I, I'm evaluating something like e to the i phi of x and e to the i uh, minus i phi of zero. Well, first I use the, you know, baker campbell hausdorff formula to put the phi of zero in the same exponential. But that again doesn't do much because the commutator of phi of x and phi of zero is just a number. So I can just put them together and then I take evaluate this and so I end up evaluating things like this, this correlator. Okay, so I have written down a lot, lots of such correlators here. This is a lot of algebra and perhaps in the homework, you can work through the algebra. I'm not going to work it through. And then from that algebra, you finally compute psi dagger of R. This is for unequal time and finite temperature. This is the most complete expression that you get. Uh, Okay, and now we take the zero temperature limit of this and then take a Fourier transform. Okay, so this is a lot of work. Uh, and it's not easy, you know, there's just a lot of complicated math, but the principle is extremely simple. And when you, the dust settle, this is the very important result that you get. So what you find, and so let me just uh, draw this. So N of K uh, has these singular terms at near KF. So let's draw at a page here. So here's N of K. And say this is KF. So what you find is that there's contributions to N of K. There's some smooth contributions, some background contribution we don't know about. We only know about singular, singular contribution. So you get a contribution, you know, it seems to come to some point and then has a, it's not analytic at KF. And on this side, uh, it's some, you know, as you move away from KF, it's K minus KF to some power. So it's K minus KF to some power sigma. And on the other side, it's, you know, here it's decreasing. So maybe there's a minus sign here. On the other side, there's a positive sign. So there's a singularity right at KF. So that's the, okay. Now if sigma was zero, uh, this would, could, so there'll be a, Yes, let me see sigma. I say if sigma is zero, then this singularity effectively becomes a discontinuity. So sigma equals zero uh, is a discontinuity. And that's what you expect in a Fermi liquid. So now there's no discontinuity in general. And what is sigma? So this sigma uh, is right here. So sigma is this number. It's related to uh, one half. It's related to this famous k, the Lutinger parameter uh, minus one. Yeah. Okay. So that's the very beautiful result. It takes you know a good good days of algebra to do it out, but uh, you know, it's very straightforward. It's just a bunch of integrals, and I've outlined what you have to do. And maybe in the homework, you'll take some of those steps. All right, so now if you put k equals one, I need get sigma equals zero. So the free Fermi gas is a Fermi liquid, no surprise there. There's a discontinuity in N of k. But the moment you move away, the moment you put any interactions, you now have one of the key characteristic of this Luttinger liquid. Uh, so this Luttinger liquid has, it still has a Fermi point. It, there's something singular at KF and the value of KF is not shifted. It's exactly KF, it's given by the density. 
And however, the singularity is not a discontinuity. It's just some sort of cusps. It's a, some sort of a non-analyticity. It's almost a discontinuity, but it, goes, it moves rather rapidly through here, uh, but it doesn't go smoothly. If you take its derivatives, you'll get some divergences. Uh, and, and that's basically one of the features of the Luttinger liquid. So this tells you effectively uh, that that the original fermion, the psi left and psi right fermions, the quasi-particles, those fermions don't exist. Uh, so this is a the, this is what sometimes people call it an example of what's called a non-fermi liquid, because there are no fermionic quasi-particles. Uh, they decay so rapidly. If you try to do the calculation we did uh, in the very first lecture of the course, or second lecture, where I computed the quasi-particle scattering rate, if you try to compute this quasi-particle scattering rate uh, in one day, you find that there are infrared divergences, and the thing just blows up as k approaches kf. Uh, and uh, the book by GMRT has many details on that. I, I won't go into it. Uh, in fact, that was discovered by people doing perturbation theory long before the Luttinger liquid theory that I presented to you, you know, as a beautiful complete theory. Took, took a lot of false attempts before it uh, took its nice, elegant form that I've described here. Uh, anyway, so the electronic quasi-particles near the Fermi surface disappear. However, an important caveat is, is that it's not to say that the Luttinger liquid theory is a theory without quasi-particles. And, and the reason is, this is a theory, which is in fact a free theory. If you want to ask the low energy properties of this theory, you want to compute its thermodynamics, you want to compute its transport properties, uh, its conductivity and conductance and all of that, that's just given by a free theory. And that's a free, so it's a theory of uh, basically density fluctuations of phonons or spin, you know, as we'll see, in fact, for a Bose gas, these are exactly the density fluctuations. Uh, so there's a theory of free bosons, and these quasi-particles are bosons, which have this relativistic dispersion. So that's the remarkable result here. You start out with the theory of fermions, and at low energy, it becomes a theory of bosons, of free relativistic bosons. Uh, and those are quasi-particles, so they don't, you know, they don't scatter off each other. They scatter very weakly of each other. It's just that when you do an experiment where you remove an electron, removing an electron from this theory or removing a fermion is a highly complicated thing. And it produces a whole shower, uh, infinite numbers of these bosons. And that's kind of evident from, from this operation. You know, removing an electron is a very, very dangerous thing to do to this, this object because the electron operator is the exponential of the actual quasi-particle operator. So if I remove an electron, it's, I've created, you know, I have one phi, I have a phi squared, I have phi cubed, I have phi to the 10. All of those operators are present and I'm creating lots and lots and lots of these bosons. So many of them, each one of them is a free, but I could really create an infinite number of them. And that's why the momentum distribution function of the uh, of the fermion doesn't look simple. So the electron completely falls apart, but that doesn't mean that there are no quasi-particles. The electron falls apart into infinite numbers uh, of these bosons. Okay, so those are rather remarkable uh, statements and they're all true and they've been tested in experiments and so on, uh, but uh, there it is and it all follows from this vertex operator connection between the fermion and the boson and the fact that the bosons are free fields. And yeah, okay. And we've shown that this thing is stable under interactions. Um, this theory should be present for arbitrary interactions. Okay, questions? I'm almost out of time. So now, you know, natural question is, this is such a beautiful theory. Let me finish this statement. Uh, how can you, if, 
is it always the answer? How can you possibly get some other answer? Uh, okay, your question. Uh, hi, yeah, my question is, we like k equals one is the self-dual point and we're yes. getting the, the Fermi liquid there. Is there anything else special other than that it's also the free theory that we get at the self-dual point or um, that's... Uh, I'm sure there are many other things that are special. This is, uh, I mean, like something that off the top of your head, I guess. Yeah, when you go to conformal field theory, there's just all kinds of extra symmetries and conserved quantities at these self dual points that, yeah, I'm not uh, not an expert on by any means. But even, you know, if you just go back to the free Fermi theory, you can see that the number of fermions at every uh, every momentum is independently conserved. So even you can already see there that in the fermionic formulation, it has an infinite number of conserved quantities. Now, finding those infinite number of conserved quantities, well, I guess even for the boson theory, it's pretty trivial here. Uh, just free bosons there too. Uh, but often, yeah, there are other, when you deal with spin systems, there are additional symmetries. And you would think that this thing only has a U1 symmetry, but there's some special SU2 symmetries, at, I think, at this point. Uh, yeah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I may be getting it not right, but uh, it's a free Fermi theory. That's really all I want to say about it. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, thank you. All right, so the question I raised, which uh, we'll turn to on Friday in more detail, which surely will be the last lecture on this topic, and then I'll go on to the quantum Hall effect. Uh, is how can you possibly, you found this nice, beautiful state, how can you possibly get out of it? The fermions always do this. Well, so from uh, from our study of bosons in higher dimensions, you can you would have a guess. So bosons we found when we put bosons on a lattice, no matter how strong the interactions, for generic densities were always superfluids. But, if you put bosons at some special density, like integer density or half integer density, they could form insulators. They could form, open up a gap and they form more insulators or charge density waves or valence bond solids or C2 spin liquids. So there's an analogous phenomenon here. Uh, and here we can, you know, it turns out that the physics for both fermions and bosons are very similar. We haven't discussed, you know, the bose hubbard model yet. So you have what you have to do is to take uh, fermions at special density. And the most important density is if you take fermions at half filling. So if you take fermions at half filling, uh, what uh, could happen if the repulsion between the fermions is large enough? Well, if I just take a very simple point of view, if you have fermions at half filling along the line, well, mm. Uh, you know, you'd put the fermion here, but no fermion here. You put them here, but not here. So you get a, this, what you'd call a charge density wave of period two, uh, and there's two of them. So these are two possible states of fermions. When they repel each other and your density is one half, uh, they, can, uh, they can just occupy every other site and lower their energy. So this would be, and this would break a symmetry. This would break the symmetry, uh, and so that would be a, you know, analog. It'd be an insulating state where the fermion gets stuck on every other side. And it turns out the Luttinger liquid knows about this, and in fact, the transition between the Luttinger liquid and this charge density wave is the famous costless Thales transition. Uh, and the way it happens, and this is what we'll talk about next time. You know, so when we're talking about fermions in momentum space, you know, here's our dispersion. So what we have been assuming so far is that you have fermions here, right moving fermions here and left moving fermions here, and they kind of scatter just nearby. They don't go very far. But it turns out when you have fermions at exactly half filling, so when you have exactly half filling, this point is at pi over two. This point is at pi over two. 
minus pi over 2. You can take two fermions here, two left movers, and make them undergo what's called an umklopf scattering event, and make them both right movers. And that's an allowed process. And the reason it's allowed is because the initial momentum of the two fermions is twice minus pi over 2, which is minus pi. The final momentum uh, is twice pi over 2, which is pi. So the change in momentum is 2 pi, and that's allowed in a lattice. You can always change total momentum by 2 pi because you don't have true translation invariance. Uh, so now, so the next step here is to, and this is the simplest term that will convert two left movers to two right movers. Uh, and what, so now you can ask, what is the bosonization of that? And the bosonization of that turns out to be the famous sine Gordon theory. So now there's a perturbation to the uh, Tomonaga-Lattinger liquid action, uh, which is the cosine of some multiple of the phi field. So that opens up a whole new uh, can of worms and many new, much new physics associated with these uh, with these operators, which appear now in the Hamiltonian, which are exponentials of this. And you can also see from this argument why these uh, operators were not allowed before. If you had generic densities, if you're not exactly at half filling, then the change in momentum for any such process, even if you took 10 particles here to 10 particles there, unless you were at some commensurate density, the change in momentum would not be an integer multiple of 2 pi. So it's not allowed. It just averages to zero. And that's what happens in the tomorrow and liquid at general density. A Fermi gas, no matter how strongly interacting, at generic density is expected to be just a thermonagalotensial liquid. Okay, we'll talk about that uh, next time then. And also discussion session tomorrow morning, which I promise to record. Any further questions? All right, great. So I hope on Friday to then finish this discussion of these sine garden field theories, just say a little bit about them. Uh, also say something about the diode of the Bose gas, the Bose Hubbard model in 1D, which we can do very quickly because it's actually quite related to the Fermi, uh, Fermi gas. And uh, then we'll start the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.